Parker, you mentioned balance and symbiosis as just a couple of these attributes of this good, better economy. Now, what characteristics do we need to develop to actually be better at creating balance and better at creating symbiosis? What kind of mindset do we need to develop? If we want people to work in the same way that the animals and plants do on the reef, if it's a symbiosis where they're saying, how can people work together you know, to complement each other in their skills and abilities to do more than any one of them could do by themselves? Are we able to achieve a balance between the different things that we need? A market mechanism We work much more effectively in an economy with cooperation rather than competition. You know, if a buyer and a seller got together and they consulted openly and honestly, this is what it costs me to make this, and what is your need, and can we agree to a just price between my effort and your need? And somehow I think that would be much better than the kind of manipulation that goes on in the market today with terms of symbiosis as well, you might say, with respect to, to energy, rather than have totally different processes, you know, for instance, you know, a giant producer of energy and a nuclear power plant on the one hand, and going somewhere else where energy is needed. If we go to other renewable sources where you can integrate, you know, local solar energy production right directly where it's needed by the users, and therefore avoid all the waste in the 25% of energy wasted in transmission, you're increasing the efficiency of the system. So, you know, these principles can in various ways be adapted to the different challenges we face in the economy. How does humanity move towards the system you describe? And how do Baha'is contribute to this movement? If you'd looked at my starting point was some of the Baha'i recommendations for a better economy. The Baha'i teachings are exactly the collection of values we need to redesign an economic system and to get away from all the distortions in the present system, driven by the profit motive, totally materialistic, ignoring social capital and, and environmental capital and so on. We have the perfect package of values. We still have to learn what a, a future Baha'i economy might look like in practice, which means you know, the experimenting. How do these values work out? We need to be exploring how the values give us different directions forward and often starting at the local community. How do we find all the many ways of cooperating with the, the crafts and the skills and abilities of each human being? And we too, too often today we ignore people who are considered as, as handicapped or something and so forth. But in fact, each of them has something more they could add to the system. You know, by being open to what everybody can contribute and not defining work as a, in a very narrow sense as some, something that is done to create a profit in a corporation, as opposed to women taking raising children, education children, you know, all the, all the things that aren't considered employment in the, in the present economy. You know, we rethink you know, from basic principles and that opens a whole set of doors for another way of designing an economy that makes social needs and is not just narrowly focused on creating wealth for the wealthy. Hi, uh, I'm Iva and I'm, I'm in Canada and um, thank you for this wonderful presentation. So social change relies either on, you know, this disconnected type of trickle down economics or purely bottom up, which tends to be really limited. We are at the edge of this major change and to replace these long standing values, um, who do we turn to to help us get this going sustainably? Um, uh, trickle um, down or bottom up? Um, and how would you view those in the coral reef economy? Trickle down doesn't work in the present economy. At the moment, it's sort of trickle up to the top. You know, wealth is more and more concentrated in the extremes the, that the neoliberal economy has taken in the last few decades. So even the theory of trickle down is not working. Bottom up, clearly, we need to start in, in at the local community because there are many, many of our needs could be met within a you know, a local circuit. Not all of them, but you know, if a community can produce more of its own food, food locally instead of having it shipped all around the world, this may be healthier and you know, avoid some of the cost of transport. But I think we have to work at all levels at once. When we're trying to transform a system, and if we have examples, look at the B Corp movement, for example, where you have corporations that have a, a business, but they've adopted social values as the core of the business, not simply profitability. Profitability, one measure of efficiency among others. It's, it's not just it's one or the other. You know, we, we have some good examples up and down the chain. And we, in the same way, we have some countries that are really trying, I think New Zealand is trying to sort of rethink its, its, its economy in a way that is much more responsive to the social needs the community needs. So there's experimentation going on that shows that it's, it's not totally hopeless. But in fact, the main problem today is, is I see it, and I've worked, I've worked at all levels, from working at local villages, you know, at the very local scale, up to the United Nations at the global level, and trying to 
you redesign the whole system from the top and the systems of governance. You know, we need to work at that, all of those levels. And so we have good things happening and being neutralized or pushed back by those for, because there's no governance at the global level. You know, these structures have escaped from any control of a national government. And they're free to do what they want at the um, local level. So it's I'm fascinated by the concept of growth in an economy and how growth, particularly of GDP, is considered to be by many people um, a measure of the vitality of an economy. And yet an ecosystem that is stable does not grow very much because there is death as well as life. My question is, how would you measure vitality in an ecosystem in a way that could be somehow transferred to an economy so that we could create a measure of vitality of an economy that is not dependent on GDP growth. GDP is absolutely the wrong measure because it has no relationship with human well-being. GDP goes up if you have lots of auto accidents and all the people being treated in the hospitals and cars that have to be built. It's wonderful for the GDP. It's not necessarily good for human welfare. So it's already the wrong kind of measure. It's trapped us in this concept. It has to keep growing forever because that's the sign is growing even better. But in a limited global system, you can't keep growing forever. You grow beyond those limits and you begin destroying, you're living off the capital of the system rather than its interest. And you're digging a hole for yourself. The people are working on alternative measures you know, to try to, to compensate for things that are wrong with it. What are the things that can grow forever? The thing about a coral reef this is not simply a little veneer of life on the surface. It has built this enormous structure, this enormous wealth, and therefore we can imagine an, an, an economy growing, increasing in efficiency and finding new ways of meeting more of people's needs beyond purely material needs. There's a sort of a saturation. Once you've got a reasonable level, you know, $10,000 a year income, you know, there's, not, there's not, no real additional well-being from having more and more money. But you can grow in beauty, you can grow in art, you can grow in culture, you can grow in science, you can grow in the information content. Those things can grow forever. They're, they're not materially limited. And therefore, you might say you'd measure the advancing of a, of, a, of a new civilization by how much it is creating in, the, in beauty and art and, and culture and scientific discoveries and even more efficient ways of meeting people's needs and of using people's skills and abilities at each point in their life. It's those kinds of measures, the things that are really human, as opposed to the purely materialistic view that GDP provides of the economy today. The question, I mean, things in which you talk about, we know um, are really important and we know we exist in a world that's um, on the verge of many existential crises. And so my question is the, is the simple question. You know, many say that social action is really the only thing that's going to motivate governments and businesses and others to make the necessary changes to be able to uh, create uh, possibilities for you know, moving forward in, in a world without destroying the world in one way or the other. Example of Greta Thunberg, of course, is the, one of the most popular here in Europe that you know, with these youth are out on the streets, uh, but we still don't see these changes. I guess like the revolution in Ukraine, the youth, young people have to stay out on the street until the until the dictator runs off to Russia. And so something like that, I think, probably has to happen for these sorts of changes. What do you think? Well, I mean, clearly there are those who say only a revolution can overthrow the system. Unfortunately, all these negative things, you know, violence and so on, tend to be more destructive than they are constructive. I think it's really much better to invest in building the alternatives. And I think all the young people marching in the streets, if they're already adopting another set of values, as they choose their careers, they choose them in renewable energy or in regenerative agriculture and things like this, you know, the parts of the economy of the future, even at a small scale, and they can then build the capacity to bring in transformation at higher and higher levels. You know, I started very locally being in my career, you know, and I ended up you know, working with the UN and helping write Agenda 21 and other things at the global level. So it is possible for people as they over time to have more and more leverage on the system. So yes, we shouldn't stay passive, but we can each work at the level where we feel our skills and abilities can best make a positive contribution. My other hope, of course, is looking at these systems models that the present economic system is running into its own sustainability limits and is probably planting the seeds of its own collapse and destruction. And therefore, it may be seem impossible to stop the giant multinationals today, you know, 
the Googles and the Amazons. At the same time, you know, the communist system in the Soviet Union collapsed overnight, quite surprisingly. Much of the recent growth in the economy has been debt-driven. You've got enormous levels of borrowing. How far can the economy be, be funded on you know, endless borrowing before at some point debt you know, bubble bursts? And I've heard a number of experiences saying we've got multiple bubble bubbles ready to burst simultaneously in a giant mega bubble. And so you know, I would say, let's not bother wasting our time trying to tear down the old system. Let's work on building a new one at whatever level of social action we can and be ready to move quickly when finally you know, the ice breaks, so to speak, and the opportunities open up. My, my question has to do with uh, the significant segment of the population, at least here in the US, and I suspect in many other countries, that is unhappy with the movement towards environmental, more environmentally friendly policies. Uh, and they, they see the decisions being made by a few people, and those people, that, in their view, aren't really adequately taking into account the impact on their economic lives. And the other related question has to do with the, the Baha'i faith emphasis on local decision making and the fact that in, in many cases, it seems to be that you need to have some uh, top-down government kinds of decisions that may run against the grain for some of the uh, negatively impact some local communities. So I was wondering if you have any thoughts on that. If we look at the Baha'i system of governance, yes, it's founded on, on local decision-making, local consultation, but it also has a level of national consultation, a level of international consultation and decision-making. So it has a balance across the levels, looking at decisions that need to be taken at each of those levels. And so, yes, you know, the foundation of, in a community is that local decision-making process. But at the same time, you, know, you also need to govern across all the levels of human organization. And therefore you need to consider what levels of governance are appropriate to each of those levels. It shouldn't be too much. You'll have subsidiarity, a lot of diversity. We often get general principles from the top and then apply differently in different parts of the world depending on local conditions. When you look at the, this issue of sensitivity to the local concerns. What's, what's interesting is in the American context, as far as I'm not an expert on it, but I've, I'm an American, but I left America in 1974, so I'm not, I can't claim much you know, recent knowledge. But in fact, the people who are complaining are the people who've been left behind by the economy and by the economic decisions taken by the wealthy because of wealth themselves. So in fact, they've been the victims of the very economy that they, they've been told they should be defending. You know, the top-down views in terms of environmental management come from science. It's the science that says we've hit planetary limits. It's the science that says the planet is warming dangerously and it's getting, it's accelerating very quickly. You know, and that science comes from thousands of scientists around the world. So it's not totally top-down. We're told we should turn to science for those things that science does advise on. What choices we should make on the basis of that science. And that's where you need some local consultation. If you have an impacted community, one, of course, one would hope that the levels of governance above it to the national level are concerned about it. How do we help people, people employed in the oil industry by the fact that we have to shut down the whole fossil fuel system within the next 10 years? You know, clearly we have to consider how do we help them to recycle their skills in new areas? You know, some countries in fact have actually already put in place social safety nets to help people adapt and, tra and, and transition in this time of rapid change. So these, these things can be dealt with rather than leaving people as victims and then building, building on their, their fear and hatred for political ends, rather than actually responding to their needs. I think um, the reflection is, although it's a little late and probably later than biologists and scientists would have liked, at least investors are now realizing that their investments are at risk as a result of climate change and the ecological crisis. The question is, I suppose, how do we encourage and build knowledge rapidly now to divert investment to more value creating alternatives? My impression is that a lot of investors you know, are very much aware of this and are moving very quickly. Now, clearly some investors are more morally motivated than others. So you've seen many faith-based groups and, you know, and churches who've been you know, moving their you know, their investments and their you know, pension funds and so on. I think the European Investment Bank has also been trying to, to adapt and look, look to the future rather than the past, recognizing the risks that are involved 
in these things. But the, the problem is more that even though you say, you know, we look at all the money being spent to deal with a pandemic and to rebuild in this aftermath. Yes, there's money going into renewable energies, but there's still three or four times as much going back into fossil fuels again because of the power of the lobbies you know, of, of these industries. And so it's not just that everybody sees the light and is going to move quickly in the new direction. There's still all of the resistances and all of the vested interests that are fighting a rear guard battle as hard as they can and, and control whole governments and, and you know, political parties and, and so forth. It would be nice if we could all listen to the advice, pay attention and make good investments. But there, you know, it's not happening when there's so much disinformation and manipulation and invested interests that are trying very hard you know, not, not to lose what they have. And you know, even just before the pandemic, there was a report on the, the fossil fuel industry and their projections for the next 10 years. And they were all planning major increases in production in spite of climate change. We now have evidence that the oil companies knew about the dangers of climate change in 1965. And they consistently ignored it, knowing they were doing the damage, but it made money. And that was all accounted for them. So until we change those values, we get the vested interests you know, that we have to struggle with. And that's, that's the human dimension of this problem, unfortunately. Uh, I admire the idea of deducing spiritual principles from natural systems. I can see the, the similarities, but there's also one big difference. And that is a natural system is just self-dependent while as uh, human systems are not, unfortunately. <laughs> and so we have spiritual values explicitly given to us rather than being deduced from nature. I, I think it, it confirms the spiritual values that we have. So I, I was just uh, thinking about the differences between natural systems and human systems, uh, socioeconomic systems. The challenge is, is always in applying those values, not really discovering them. The challenge to me, and I think to the world, is how do we apply these things that a lot of people would agree to in principle, but uh, they find it very difficult to actually bring about. You're talking about the harmony of science and religion. Baha'u'llah said, nature is God's will and in and through the contingent world. So the natural systems are following divine law. And that's why they're a good place to look for people who want a, a proven model and not just some theory about what some value can do. I chose that as my field of study because as a Baha'i, I wanted to say, what can I learn about Baha'i principles from natural systems? My whole career has been trying to find the parallels and the reinforcement, the complementarity and the, le the learning that can come from one and the other as we go forward. So at the higher levels of information, when we go beyond simply the, you know, the physical laws and the chemical laws and the biological laws, get to the human laws, there we have more choice. It's not just God's will applied at those levels. We have to choose. We, we have a human will to, to apply there. And God sends us teachers from time to time and he tells us religion is the only solution to this problem. You need to love God. You're willing to sacrifice. You have to apply the spiritual values. And then the other, all the other things will work themselves out. That, that's why, in a sense, again, you know, the natural systems are simply confirming the direction we should be going in for those who are skeptical about some divine principle they don't, they don't have the confidence in. But if you truly believe that what God is telling us is what we should be doing today, then everything fits together. You know, it's all part of one fantastic global system. We need to save as much as we can on the natural side if we want to improve the human side as well. It requires going beyond just the economic system to change the values behind it. And that's of course the purpose of religion. Just the thought really that um, as intricate and ingenious as a coral reef is, it doesn't have any moral aspect to it. It's uh, morality free, if you like. It is what it is. I'm not a scientist, but I would say Gravity does what it does because it does what it does. It doesn't have a decision-making process in it. it. It just is. And in that sense, although much more complicated, perhaps a coral reef does what it does naturally without any kind of moral impulsion or, or consciousness. And that's what makes us different. And it's what makes trying to devise an economic system on the basis of a natural uh, system almost impossible. Um, Adam Smith, when he wrote his great treatise in the 18th century, thought there was an invisible hand that worked through the economy, that was manifest in the economy. And I think that idea has been uh, debunked. 
So, uh, sorry to be contrarian, but um, no, no, no. I, we I, want to be I, controversial. I, I fully agree, but Adam Smith yeah. also wrote about moral sentiments. He took the spiritual dimension, you know, as given, and he expected that invisible hand to come from people's moral sentiments, and he wrote about that as well. We've distorted his thinking to reinforce the materialist economy of today in a way that's quite, you know, quite inhuman. It's all, it's all part of the mythology built around the, you know, the present economic system and its material ends. So yes, we do function at a moral level. Of human. Even some animals show a certain level of morality. Some of the higher, the more intelligent animals, dolphins and so on, work together, take care of their, of, of their young and maybe even, even a dead baby, maybe dogs show a certain sense of justice. If you give, teach two dogs to do a trick and you, you give that sort of give it, a, give it a little reward, and then you get, the other dog does the trick, you give it a bigger reward, the first dog might re refuse to do it a second time. He didn't get as big enough reward as the other one got. So you know, there, there's, a, there's a certain blurred area of morality even below the, the human level. <laughs> but yes, we function larger and moral, which is precisely why we need religions from time to time to give us the moral guidance the moral framework within which we can be evolving to higher steps of evolution, following the model of the coral reefs. You know, it, yes, it, it doesn't require moral principles to function. It's been, you might say, a, a, a trial and error within the framework of God's laws for millions and millions of years. But it shows the potential. If we want to, at our moral level, adopt the spiritual principles that allow us to design a new and better economy that really is trying to improve human well-being, that will open up our potential to build a system you can, like the coral reef that is hot, full of wealth, highly dense, even in resource poor environments, able to support many, many people at a, at a, at a wonderful standard of living. So it actually gives her a hope for the future for what we can develop in, a, in an ever evolving, ever advancing world society once we get over you know, the moral challenges of the unethical you know, decisions being made at the present time. I think uh, that there is a, a metaphysical principle at work that, that makes the efficiency of people's efforts uh, proportional to how much aligned they are with God's purposes. And that as people differ from God's purposes, they become less efficient or less effective at what they're doing. And if they are contrary to God's purposes, that they actually start undermining themselves and work uh, explicitly to their own detriment. In consultation, as people approach God's principles, they become very effective at solving problems. Uh, but we see a number of national leaders that mysteriously seem to actually take efforts to undercut themselves. I mean, you just wonder why they're doing what they're doing, because, because they're stupidly greedy. And you go, what, what possible thing is happening? that people become stupidly greedy at some point. And I, I think that is a God's principle that we just haven't recognized but yet. It's clear that the human being has a potential both for good and for evil. We are born with an ego. One of the aims of spirituality is to acknowledge that we have an ego, that we have to learn to manage it. We need to learn to direct its, its energies in constructive ways and not in destructive ways. And we learn to become more altruistic and the more, in a sense, our values fits with God's purpose, with a higher spiritual purpose, which is a real purpose of human beings, the more, yes, we are in harmony and we can advance. But when that ego takes over, it blinds people to that good side. But they think they're doing the good thing. They, I wouldn't call it a metaphysical principle. It's simply that's the way you know, human beings work in this spectrum, our, 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 might say our free choice between good and evil, between altruism and, and, and selfishness, that is needed into the very nature of man that we each have, each have to struggle with in some way or another. Uh, thank you, Arthur, for a fantastic talk and also everyone for actually really stimulating questions that drew out. We got deeper and deeper into practicalities of this as we moved along because we don't want it just to be a talking shop. There's this wonderful quotation from Abdul Baha where he says to the believers, the cause of God should be a dynamic force transforming the lives of men and not a question of committees, meetings, unnecessary debates, futile discussions. It's fabulous. I think it's from Star of the West, but you'll find it in the compilation on Deepening. How we make a contribution, more to the point, is how we raise our capacity that we can really make a difference. And to highlight one thing from this, later in the questions, we were drawing out, you know, what levels do we make decisions on? And Arthur's drawing out points about consult consultation and subsidiarity and raising capacity to make these decisions. This is the essential point of the current series of plans. 
is to raise is to learn how to raise capacities within populations, not just within the Baha'i community, but in your neighborhood and village, if, if you're passing the second master in the process of growth, you're learning how to engage people in the process of social change, provide training and accompany them into action, enabling them to become protagonists, enabling skills of cooperation and consultation to make collective decisions at the level of the cluster, at the level of the neighborhood and village. Once we've raised this capacity, you're taking that capacity and you're applying it to the problems of that neighborhood, that village, that cluster, that region. So this is how we will address the problems of society. Also, the subject of economics is, is important. The House of Justice offered it to us for our consideration in the Rizwan 2012 message. And they obviously there was the first of March message 2017 on the economic life of humanity, in which they make the point that this isn't about the development of grand systems. This is us thinking about ourselves as actors in an economy. But the more we advance the plan, the more our actions have impact to make a difference. And the House have alluded to as we really advance along the continuum of development, the society building powers of the faith become manifest. But coming back to the work at the future meetings of the special interest group, as we go out and have conversations with people on themes of relevance, meaningful and distinctive conversations, and as the, the world moves further into crisis, which Arthur's own grass implies that it will, and the latest message of the house in the first paragraph, if you look, very clearly implies there's more and more challenges coming. There are certain themes that we need to be able to give intelligent answers correlating the writings of the faith to the things we see in society. And this brings us to the next five meetings. They're going to comprise lightning talks. The first theme is extremes of wealth and poverty, which you all know the eradication of this is the central theme of the faith. And on the first of Arthur's slides, the third point, he made three points, the third was eradication of poverty. So there's a direct connection there to Arthur's talk. The second presentation is on the meaning of work. You know, Baha'i see the purpose of work as being service, not in fact uh, maximizing our utility through self-interest. So it's about how we see work. This is a central teaching of the cause. Um, and the second point in Arthur's first slide was providing meaningful work. Um, and so, you know, this is a challenge so to think about. And the first bullet point was strongly altruistic and cooperative in nature. So this tells us something about the meaning of work. This is a very relevant subject to be able to talk about because pretty much everyone works or is funded by someone who works or is affected by work. So it's a good area for Baha'is to be studying, improving our capacity to converse. Um, the third topic is the financial system. And we've just had a talk by a systems theorist. Can I call you that, Arthur? Is that a correct term? The fourth talk is on the purpose of the economy, um, but particularly with thought about indicators and well-being. And that's already come up in this talk. So you can see the relevance and the practical nature of these themes that have been chosen. And then the fifth one is Baha'i perspectives on things like capitalism, socialism, and communism. It's more how we engage Baha'i ideas to the way that the old, old order, you know, when a socialist comes to you and they're attached to the idea, when a capitalist comes to you and they're attached to these ideas, what are constructive perspectives that we can bring from the Baha'i Baha teachings on these areas? So those are the five themes that, we've, that have been chosen, and they'll be on the 20th of every month for the next five months. So that's all from me. Thank you so much, Arthur. I love that. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I'm just going to pass back to Richard as the host. Thank you again. Thank you, Arthur. So um, thank you very much, Arthur. Thank you all for coming in and enjoying a bit of underwater you know, scenery for a while as another way of looking at e economics. <laughs>